All right, what is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another day of Saber Sims DFS Office Hours. It is Tuesday, March 7th of 2023 here. Looks like we are looking ahead to an eight-game NBA slate as well as a 10-game hockey slate. I know the players is teeing off uh, early on Thursday morning, so it should be a fun week of DFS. Always nice when the players come around. should be a big uh, golf tournament, a lot of excitement. But for those of you who are new here, welcome. My name is Andrew, one of the coaches over here at SaberSim. It's a show where we go over how to use the SaberSim app, answer any and all DFS-related questions. You can post questions live in the YouTube chat or in the Office Hours channel in our Discord server. If you're not in our Discord, there's a link in the description below. Always nice to be in the Discord. A lot of good DFS conversation happening each and every day. And the great thing is that if a question pops in your head throughout the day as you're building lineups, just drop it in the Office Hours channel, let it sit there, and then we will get to it on the very next show. We do this show Monday through Friday, 2 p.m. Eastern. But that being said, going to get Saber Sam pulled up here. And it looks like we have three questions to get us started today. Three questions all came in in the Discord. Thank you for posting those, everybody. And if you, anybody else has questions as they're tuning in, uh, just drop them in the chat. We will get to all the questions before the end of the show. But uh, looks like our first question came in from Elder. And Elder dropped this one in last night. Said, if a player who has the highest projection at every percentile for an NBA showdown slate does not populate as captain for any lineups in, say, the top 150 lineups, would you recommend to ever manually boost exposure to that player? Okay, really good question here. So, um, you know, right off the bat, I think that if there is a play that you like that you are not getting to, I think it is totally okay to boost that player. Also, especially for showdown formats, I think it's okay to dive really far into your pool. I think of showdown a lot differently than I do these classic slates. Most because the game is only going to play one time and each sim is a game script, right? So in showdown, you know, we're simming each game one time. We aren't trying to find these like really uh, high upside outcomes where everyone scores really well. Like you might get a low scoring game. You, you might get like a game really close to the to the uh, projected total right so i think it's okay to like search for game scripts that you believe are going to happen and then prioritize those game scripts regardless of where they end up in your lineup pool so like for instance i remember um when max won a milli in the nfl showdown i had him on the show we talked and he was just really into justin fields thought justin fields was just a great play at captain and um, the the winning lineup that he had was way down in his pool, like 1,400 out of like 2,500. But he got to it because he just uh, wanted to capitalize on Justin Fields' upside and played a bunch of him, which which led to him getting uh, to that 1,400th lineup in his pool, right? So I think that probably the reason you weren't getting to that play is like due to salary and due to, um, you know, what it costs to roster that player, and what that allows you to get in your other flex spots. Um, you know, I don't know what, what showdown you played exactly, but I do know that like Nikola Jokic was in like one of the showdown games and he had a subpar performance and he always grades out really well, just like on a projection basis, on a percentiles basis. So I think if you want to get to more of those plays, I think that's okay. I think that if you're not getting to them in the top, you know, 150 lineups, I think that's saying something. So I wouldn't go from, you know, no exposure to like, jamming them in at like, you know, 50%, 100% of my captains. But, you know, if you want to get some exposure to them, you know, mash the field, maybe, maybe just uh, have even like half the ownership, whatever it is. I think that's totally okay. Uh, Player by player basis there. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, not, not a wrong or right answer. I think that, you know, if having some of that player helps you uh, to accept whatever happens in the game, I think that's okay. And and I, I think it's okay to take some stands at times, especially in showdown formats, but really good question there. Next question came in from sequence in the discord. And the question says for XFL, say I do not want any lineups with running backs in the flex spots. What is the most efficient way to achieve this with Saber Sim? Thank you. Yeah. So I was actually looking at this one this morning, wanted to make sure 
Um, I could figure this out prior to the show. So I'm going to go back to last week because we do not have projections up for this upcoming Saturday yet. But what I would do, right? So if you run an XFL build and you look at the lineup, so you have one running back slot, but then you have two flex uh, spots, right? So definitely different than like traditional NFL where you have two running back spots and only one flex position. But in order to do this, what I would do is I would set up a automatic group rule in the home screen. And the rule would look like this. It would be a rule type group selection method automatic. And then I would say use no more than one. And then I would just do my positions and I would do running back. And then what SaberSim is going to do is it is going to look at the position column for your when when building your lineups and make sure making sure that there is no more than one running back used in your entire lineup. So I ran a build for this, testing it out. And what it returned was the easiest way to check is just go to the flex column and click on the flex players and see the positions being used there. So I have a tight end and seven wide receivers. I have no running backs in my flex spot. This is a build I ran after I set up that rule. So that is exactly how I would do it. You would you will only get the one running back and the running back spot, and then your flexes will be taken up by tight ends and wide receivers. So that is how you do that. Let me know if you have any follow-up sequence, but uh, I think we nailed that one there. And then uh, two questions here from Trudy. I think these are good questions. Hello, Trudy. Haven't uh, heard from you in a little while. So first question here from Trudy says, Hi, Andrew. I've noticed there is no longer a way to view how many lineups have changed after late swap or a way to review the changes made. If this is due, is this due to an intentional change or am I missing something? So Trudy, I think you are missing something here. Um, no fault to you. We we don't make it uh, particularly uh, clear that we've made a lot of changes to the app with the way late swap works and basically things just get cluttered. It looks like Trudy is here. Hey, Trudy. Uh, so I'm going to show you a late swap that I ran yesterday and show you how to view this. So just give me a second to pull that up. I don't uh, build lineups on that specific account that, that I'm using for the show. Most of because of all of the rules we said, it's going to, uh, uh, at times I forget to turn everything off and uh, it can, it can mess up my, my actual builds that I use, but I'm just going to swap over here. Uh, so these are some late swaps that I ran yesterday. And if you want to see, one, how many lineups were changed. What you would do is hover over this lineups button here. So there it is right there. So I'm hovering like over the actual numbers. And then it says 40 changed lineups, 75 unchanged lineups. So it looks like when you hover right over the numbers, it works. If you hover over the lineups word, it does not work. So hover over the uh, number of lineups in the parentheses and it should pop up. And then if you uh, put your cursor on an individual lineup on any of of the like players or the or the stats here, you'll get a pop up that says original lineup. So then we have an original lineup pop up on the screen here, and then you can just uh, go back and forth and see who changed. So in this lineup, it looks like nobody changed. So this was one of our unchanged lineups. And then if you, we go to the next one, we can do the same thing. And it looks like this was probably another one that did not change. So like there was like 40 that did change and then so many that didn't. Um, interesting here on this third lineup, the pop-up is not uh, appearing. And this fourth one as well. So not really sure. Okay, it is on this fifth one. So it looks like there's like a little inconsistency here. So I'm going to make a note for myself. Uh, inconsistency with original lineups late swap and then i will uh take that back to the team it's like kind of where the first two worked and then the fifth one worked and then the third and fourth one didn't work perfectly uh so trudy said yes so that feature has disappeared for me over the last three days it used to be there okay so it might be related to like um this what i'm seeing right now where like it's showing for some lineups and then for others it's it's not always popping up consistently so I'll take that back to the team. Could be what's happening to you, but in general, that is how you will do it. Um, so let me uh, figure out what's going on there, but thank you for bringing it to my attention there. And then second question here from Trudy said, get this in the chat. All right. Also, if I want to build with 009 
and set a rule to include two players with my own less than X, would it be ideal to increase that number a bit on smaller slates as opposed to larger slates? Just trying out new strategies. Thanks in advance. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of intuitive sense to me just because, you know, as the slate size shrinks, uh, ownership is going to concentrate less available options. People are going to play, you know, more of like the best plays. So I think that, you know, what you could probably do on any given day is come in here and uh, I'm actually going to swap back here is uh, sort, but basically just like sort by ownership and uh, see what the lowest owned plays are, what their projections are, uh, maybe set like a projection filter prior to checking that out and then see where you want to make that cut off, right? So that's something that I will normally do for like a projection filter. If I want to set one is like, I will scroll down here and see, you know, where is like the lowest player that I'm comfortable playing for the night. And then I could set that number. Usually for me, it's like somewhere around like seven ish projection. I'm, I'm usually okay. Letting the builder handle the rest there. But I think you could do that on like a night by night basis. Right. So come in, start by my own and then see where, you know, that less than 10 number is, and then see how many of these plays you're comfortable playing. Like I'm, I'm fine playing, you know, all, a lot of these guys, shy Gil, just Alexander and, Anthony Edwards, Christoph Porzingis, all under 10%, right? Uh, maybe you want to go down to like, you know, 5% and see what these guys are. Joel Embiid, Julius Randle, like a ton of good plays at this salary range or at this uh, ownership range. I think, it, I think you know, this is one way to try and make sure you're getting to like low-owned upside plays. A lot of these guys still have really high projections and have low ownership. So I think that is a definitely a viable strategy if you come in and like all these guys are like 10%, it's like a four game slate, you know, maybe adjust that rule to uh, be a little bit higher ownership, maybe 10 to 15%. But definitely think that uh, the thought process, the the road that you're going down has some, um, has some merit and can be profitable. So good luck to you in that. But all right, that is our last question in the Discord. Hopping over to the YouTube chat here. Uh, looks like we got one question from Demetrius. So we are going to hit this and then probably go into our uh, NBA injury review. And then if anybody has any more questions, now is a great time to do that. All right. Demetrius said, should I use projections from another source or use Saberson projections instead? Uh, yeah, I don't think it's like a uh, all or none kind of thing. Uh, frankly, what I would do is uh, use some type of aggregate, right? So if you're like, uh, joined up with Run Pure, which I think you are, Demetrius. We've, we've probably talked about that in the past. Uh, there's like an added feature here to aggregate or average the projections from SaberSim and Run Pure. I think that's totally fine. Uh, if you're on the pro plan, what you can do is you can upload projection sources from other uh, sites or your own custom projections, whatever you're doing. You could save those and you could aggregate them and then you could, you know, average them. You could uh, weight them favoring one source over more than another or more than others and uh, do something like that. But I, I don't think it's like has to be this all or none approach. I think, you know, you get some like wisdom of the crowd. You get some uh, averaging out. So like, let's say, you know, we like Saber Sim is like high on one player opposed to other sites that kind of averages out. And then if another side is high on other players, you know, you, you get this kind of middle ground, you get some input from all the sources. And I think aggregating is totally uh, viable and okay. That's why, you know, we built in functionality to support that. We think it's a viable strategy. We know a lot of top players are doing that. So I, I, I don't, I don't see anything wrong with, with aggregating in that scenario, but really good question there. And uh, see like Chuck, is typing in the discord. So we're going to hop over and look at the NBA injury report while we wait for some more questions to come in here. But really it's just like a segment to, uh, you know, let some people get the DFS juices flowing, get some questions rolling in and give you guys an idea of uh, injury news to be aware of some places that you might want to do some additional research and try and uh, add some value to your process. So right off the bat here, Wendell Carter Jr. Being questionable, uh, will be important. This news will be out before lock, but Mo Wagner was priced down uh, pretty significantly last game and uh, was a high value play. He did just fine. So I think he was at like Mo Wagner was at like 31, 3,200. He's been priced up to like 3,900 here. 
I think Bobo is like pretty interesting. Uh, I thought he was going to play more than uh, more than like 20 ish minutes last game. And he didn't, but he ended up playing like very efficiently and he actually scored 28 points with Mo Wagner scoring about 27. So Bobo definitely like played uh, above expectation from like an FPM basis. But I think like he still has some merit to, to possibly get in, especially when Mo Wagner is like 50% owned and Bobo is like 1% owned. Uh, if you go back to last game, you know, uh, he did grade out better. I, I, I'm still concerned about his minutes. I thought he was going to play a little more than he did. I think he got like up to like 19 total minutes and I was hoping him to get to like 25, but uh, just something to consider with, uh, with one, his salary not changing very much and Mo Wagner's changing significantly. And if Wendell Carter sits, that could be a good pivot off of some ownership chop, but just some thoughts there for you guys. Some, that's a, that was definitely a stand that I took last game. Uh, Kyle Kuzma being questionable, definitely important, uh, you know, gives a lot of extra um, weight to Porzingis and Beal, some of these other top players. I know Beal, I saw Beal like had a good game, was on fire, had the fire emoji on DraftKings. So uh, interesting to see what happens with Kyle Kuzma there. Again, all this news will be out before lock. And then uh, big names here, James Harden questionable, Tobias Harris questionable, Jalen McDaniels played, uh, you know, ba- like quite a bit. I thought that Georges Nyang was going to like uh, split a little more time, but that did not happen to be the case. Jalen McDaniels was pretty efficient and Nyang had like five fouls. So that could have like hurt his minutes there. But the fact that Jalen McDaniels is 3,100 again, just played 28 minutes, played pretty efficiently, uh, should be another in another really good spot if Tobias Harris does end up sitting here. And then uh, Shake Milton played like, a lot of minutes off the bench yesterday actually played uh, pretty well. So I know he was a name that I threw out if DeAnthony Melton, if he started ahead of DeAnthony Melton, but he did not start. Uh, but this game was really high scoring and Shake Milton ended up playing 30 minutes and played pretty efficiently here. So I think if James Harden sits, you know, he's probably going to end up starting at, at uh, as like the, the point guard role, uh, maybe like alongside Maxi. So maybe we see something like, Maxi Milton, Embiid, uh, McDaniel's, and Melton, or something like that. Uh, so yeah, another name to watch, especially uh, still at min salary here, especially if James Harden sits. So it could be a lot of value opening up on the 76ers, and this game does start after lock, so it will be a timing thing to see when the, when this news comes out. Uh, Jalen Brunson questionable. I know Emmanuel quickly had a huge game with him out over the weekend. Looks like they they priced up quickly just a little bit. He was at 4700 on Saturday and is at 5000 now. So should be in like another huge spot if Jalen Brunson does end up sitting. Uh, Double OT did help him out a lot, got him up to like 70 points. So it was a huge day for him. I know RJ Barrett played really well as well, and he's only at 5300 So quickly and Barrett at this price tag, if Jalen Brunson sits, seem like they're in another really good spot. All right. Uh, Scrolling through here, Walker Kessler, uh, questionable. This would open up a uh, lot of extra playing time for Kelly Olenek, and Kessler has been the higher priced of the two. So, like, Kessler is at 7K, Olenek is at 6K here. So, you know, if Kessler uh, sits, more usage for Olenek probably, and uh, I could see his value going up. And that is in a later game, so definitely like a late top opportunity there. And then the D'Angelo Russell news here, right? So AD is in. Russell, questionable, hasn't been playing, been dealing with an ankle injury. Uh, Russell's price tag, pretty good here at 6300 So, you know, we could see a lot of usage for Russell and Davis if they both end up playing here. Uh, so it will be interesting to see what ends up happening with D'Angelo Russell. Not really sure how to uh, optimize for late swap off the top of my head there. And then looking at players that are already out. Oh, Giannis is out. I did not know that. Drew Holiday is out as well. So it should be a lot of value on Milwaukee here. Just sort by value. Uh, Javon Carter, Chris Middleton, both above six value here. And then scrolling down, I saw Detroit had like a ton of players out today. So let's let's go over to Detroit. Going to see a lot of value here. Five players over six value, two over seven. Uh, should be another big value spot for Detroit and the, the, the spread's actually pretty close here, like five and a half at the moment. I'm surprised. 
Uh, let's see what else we got. Not a lot of big names in the later games that are out. So I think we're going to see like a lot of ownership in at lock with all of this Detroit and Milwaukee value here. I do think there is some opportunity to, to possibly wait and get some of this Philly value if it doesn't come out prior to lock. Uh, but we will see what these updates come out through the day. So, that, so those are the spots that I would be paying attention to and trying to capitalize on, but hope you all get something out of that. It looks like we have a couple more questions that rolled in here since we started. So going to jump back to Saberson here and knock out these questions. First one from Chuck the Pure in the Discord. Chuck said, Jordan recommends doing one less mini unique than the maximum value of mini uniques. I've also been noticing that the mini uniques I can use goes down by one when I late swap. With this in mind, what do you think a good approach would be? Yeah, I think uh, I think Jordan's recommendation is good. I think that, you know, Jordan is somebody who is like um, kind of trying to get as diverse as possible from what I've uh, talked about him with. You know, Jordan is like somebody who is like playing all the slates, all the showdowns most nights. Uh, He's like a a real grinder in that way. Uh, I think it makes sense, you know, when you're playing a lot of lineups to get as diverse and you're kind of hoping one hits. I take like a little less of a uh, huge diversity approach. So I'm at four mini uniques here. We're fine. Five mini uniques. We're fine. At six, six mini uniques, I lose my 20 lineups. I only have 11. So Jordan's approach would be, you know, to basically do this exercise and then, okay, at six, I don't have enough lineups. And let me go back to five and then let me stop there. And then you could see that, you know, your last lineup is lineup 422 here in 421. Uh, see, like for me, the, the way I like to play is like, you know, this is probably too many lineups, like from low in the pool, like 422, 421, 415, 411, 400. So I have like five lineups out of my 20, which is like 25% uh, in this 400 range. Not the approach that I would like to take. I prefer to use like half of my lineup as many uniques. And now I'm in, I'm, I'm no deeper than lineup 200, which is still like the top 50% of my pool. And I know that half of every lineup in my 20 are different from every other lineup, right? So like there's no wrong or right answer. It really comes down to personal preference. This is just the way that I like to play. If I can get to about half of my lineups uh, being unique from every other lineup and staying in the top 50% of my pool, that's where I want to be. But Jordan's approach is, is different, right? Jordan is probably playing more lineups than I am like uniquely and wants to get more spread out. So no wrong or right way to do it. And then as far as late swap, I think mini uniques and late swap are interesting. Uh, I think if value opens up after lock and min uniques, increasing min uniques is taking you away from that value, I think it's okay to lower it. So like I, I have seen the similar thing as you, like, you know, maybe I can get to four pre-lock and then lock hits. Uh, I might only be able to get up to three, but let's say, you know, Tyus Jones was a uh, late value play uh, that came out after lock. So I know that his ownership is probably going to be deficient, not as highly owned as he should be. Uh, you know, if I go to three mini uniques and I'm getting 95 exposure to Tyus Jones, but then I go to four mini uniques and I'm only getting to 75%, I might be okay with going with less mini uniques just to get to the best value plays of the slate at that point. And another thing that I'm paying attention to is how many of my players have locked, how many of my top exposed players have locked already. So if, if, you know, I have like three out of the five top exposures locked already, uh, that's a lot of lineup positions. That's a lot of salary. I'm okay playing even less mini uniques just to get to the best available plays that are left. I know that some of that mini unique equity is probably already locked in with so many players being locked. And now I'm just trying to get to the best plays. So I would say don't let mini uniques stop you from getting to the best value plays that are going to be insufficiently owned in the post slate lock phase when you're late swapping. So those are like my thoughts on that. And it looks like Chuck had a follow-up here. Chuck said, I like that approach. I don't want to set meaning so high that I can't maintain that number post lock. Yeah. I mean, I think it's okay to like decrease it as the slate goes on. It's like similar to when we say like, Hey, you know, uh, lower, I'm um, actually on beta right now. So like lower sliders as the slate goes on. So you get to more of the best plays. 
Uh, similar thought process, you know, lower mini leagues to allow more of the best plays to get into your lineups, especially as players begin to get grayed out and these uh, high exposed players get locked into your lineups. As the night goes on, you probably don't need to maintain the mini leagues as much or make that as high of a priority. A really good question. All right, uh, jumping over back to the YouTube chat. I have a question from Cortez Martin. It says, if I'm building 150 lines for NBA, but don't necessarily want to use the first 150 Sabre score lines, what's the best way to filter through the lines? For example, what if I want to use lineup 31, 26? So if, if there's ever a lineup and you're, you know, searching for it, whatever you're doing, you're maybe you're doing like some type of player filters to find a specific combination. If there's a lineup in here that you're not playing, like that's grayed out like this, all you have to do is hit this lock icon. By hitting this lock icon, we will add the lineup to your number of lineups. And then if you were to change this back to 20 from 21, we will make sure and prioritize the lineup that you've locked. So uh, the lineup that has this green lock button is going to be prioritized above all other lineups. So even if we set this to one lineup now, we are going to make the locked lineup your lineup regardless of whatever lineups were a higher Sabre score prior to you doing that action. So locked lineups always get priority. I think that's the best way to add a lineup to your set. Um, as far as, you know, if if you don't want to use like the top 150 Sabre score lines, I think using mini uniques is great. You're going to add diversity. And by doing that, you're going to smooth out your variance over time. And you're going to play really good lineups that uh, still are, you know, high in your pool. So if, if I... If I change, you know, mini uniques to two, instead of using my top 20, I'm now down to lineup 26. So that means, you know, I'm skipping some lineups along the way. I'm skipping 22. I'm skipping 20 because there's too many similar players there, right? And then that number only increases as I increase mini uniques. And then now, you know, my lineup, uh, I'm using 20 lineups from lineups one through 52. So definitely skipping many along the way there. But if there's a specific lineup you want to use, I would use the lock icon. All right. Clay Davis has a question. Says, how do I set a rule if I want one between three players under 10%? Okay. So what I would do is probably you'll have to set two rules here. So then the first rule would say would be a group rule selection method automatic. And then it's going to say use at least one. And then I'm going to add a requirement. And my requirement is going to be my own. Uh less than 10% here. And then I'm going to save that. And then what this is going to do is it is going to create a group rule for you that includes all players under 10% owned. So all 146 players here that are under 10% owned, SaberSim will automatically create this group for you. So then now you have a rule that says at least one player under 10% owned. And then I would create a second rule that is a group automatic rule that says use no more than three and then add the same requirement that my own less than 10. And then this will uh, create the same group for you. Should be 146 players again. Yep. And then it'll say use no more than three. So this is how you create like an in-between rule. You got to set two rules. There's no like in-between feature, uh, but it doesn't take that long to set the two rules, but that is how I would do it. Cortez Martin said, how do I get to the Sabre, uh, Sabre score 2.0? So in order to use Sabre Score 2.0, you have to be on the Pro Plan. So if you're on the Standard Plan, uh, you can upgrade to the SaberSim Pro. You can do it by messaging us at uh, support at SaberSim.com or using the Reporter Problem and asking about an account upgrade. I'm not sure exactly uh, how you do it um, in the My Account page. If you can, I think you have to message us. So easiest way to contact us is use the Reporter Problem, send an email to support at SaberSim.com or uh, post a message in the support channel in the Discord. Those are the three ways to get a hold of our support team, and we'll be happy to take and, uh, take care of you from there. Once you are on Saber Sim Pro, you will have access to the Pro channel in the Discord, and from there, there is a message pinned at the top with instructions about how to access the beta version of Saber Sim, where Saber Score 2.0 is being tested out. All right. Uh, baseball break review says sound advice other day here. You mentioned waiting for that second round of $4 DFS tourneys with the money prize lower and lock out the pros. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that's like a great one, right? You could definitely uh, wait it out, you know, wait till like an hour before lock 
and wait for some of these second prize pools to open up where, you know, the Uticals are not in there. The petty thefts are not in there. The giant squids are not in there, right? Uh, you, prize pool is smaller, field is smaller, but all the pros are locked out and you get to play against some uh, weaker competition without some of these sharks in there. So glad you're able to uh, take advantage of that. I think that is a huge, uh, huge value add and just a, a really good opportunity in general to uh, find some additional edge, right? We talk a, a lot I'll say this every once in a while. Oh, it looks like you won. Congrats, man, man. Congrats. But yeah, we'll say like, you know, you could be the best, you could be the 10th best poker player in the world. If you're sitting at the table with the other nine best, you are now the worst player at the table. So a lot of it comes down to contest selection and finding opponents that you can beat over the long term. But uh looks like we have quite a few viewers still. If anybody has any final questions, now is a good time to get them in. We've uh, done like two rounds of questions. We've done the NBA injury report happy to hang out and uh keep chatting if there are any additional questions but um you know if if not that's fine we'll be right back here tomorrow 2 p.m eastern for our wednesday show i always tell everybody if you're building lamps throughout the night and have questions just post them in the office hours channel let the questions sit there we'll get to them on the next show looks like elder did exactly that thank you elder that gives us a steady queue of questions to get rolling on and uh always appreciate that from you guys but uh, if you're not joined up with Saber Sam, want to check us out. A uh, ton of DFS action happening each and every day. I know we got tennis tomorrow, uh, probably building golf lineups tomorrow. We got NBA, we got NHL, MMA, League, CSGO, just a, a XFL on Saturday, F1, NASCAR, just so many DFS sports to play this time of year. So if you're not joined up with us, there's a link to a seven-day, no-strings-attached free trial in the description of this video. Check us out. Tune into this show. Get your questions answered. Join the Discord, ask questions in the community, and participate in different conversations happening each and every day. But until tomorrow, I will uh, – oh, no, one from Trudy here. Trudy said, one more question while I have you. Is there a rule to set where I can force the highest-priced stud in the latest game into the flex position for more late swap flexibility? Okay, so what I would do here is I would just filter for the late game here and then I would just sort by salary. And then I would look, Anthony Davis is the highest uh, player here. And then what I would do is I would set a 100 min exposure to Anthony Davis. And then because he is in the late game, he should automatically go into the flex unless there are no other good center options. And then he gets put into um, the center role. But by forcing him into 100 lineups, that's going to give you a lot of flexibility in the post build. So what you could do is like, okay, AD is in hundred percent of lineups. He's in some utility, but he's in some center. So what I would do is I would just go to utility and then I would uh, put his min exposure in the utility to hundred percent because you put, you forced him into so many lineups. It should be very easy for the builder to have enough available lineups with him in the utility to fill up your lineup spots here. And one thing that's um, interesting is that it's only showing him in 33% of the pool. So I don't know why it's doing that. Um, what did I do here? Oh, okay. So what I did, no, he's in all. So I have all set to 100 min exposure. Uh, that should have worked to put him in all of your lineups. So it should be like 500 out of 500. So I'm just going to check this out. Okay. Yeah. So he is in hundred percent of the pool, but he's in 183 in the utility spot. So I think another thing that you could do is instead of using the all tab here for your min exposure, you can actually use the utility column. So I would go to utility on the home screen, and then I would set the min exposure to 100 in the utility. And then I'm going to run this build again and see what happens here. So it seems like the uh, columns on the home screen are being honored in the post build here. So let's give this a shot. Lineups are building. Lineups are finalizing. And it looks like here in the post build, uh, he is the only player being used in the utility column. So that is how I would do it. I would go to the utility. I would set the highest salary player uh, to 100% min exposure. And it looks like late swap or the builder will honor that when building your lineups. So that is how you do that. Glad I was able to get that one answered for you. But uh, a lot of good questions today. So until tomorrow, get your questions in the Office Hours channel throughout the day. 
and good luck. Take care. I will see you all. Bye.